G'day, welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left Show. My name is Alex Bainbridge from Green Left. Before we get underway, I do want to acknowledge that we're recording this show on the stolen Aboriginal country. Uh, this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Sovereignty was never ceded. We pay our respects to elders and warriors past and present. Also at the beginning, I do want to say that if you like the work that we do, please become a Green F supporter. It is the number one way that you can support our project. It's the best way to receive the content that we produce. And also it is just a necessary financial contribution. Plans start from just $5 a month and uh, we appreciate whatever you're able to contribute. Now today we're going to be discussing the question about climate politics. In particular, the, um, the climate bill that was passed uh, by the lower house last week. This bill contains the miserable 43% target that Labor took to the election. And I think it's also important to note that this, even the 43% target is a bit misleading in, in a number of ways. It's a 43% reduction from 2005 levels. And even just on the coalition settings, they were probably on track for around about 30% reduction anyway. This is because of most of that, most of that reduction, you know, so-called reduction in emissions uh, would have come from the change in land use um, sector, uh, which is basically the Australia clause, the dodgy accounting trick that Australia um, managed to get included in the Kyoto Protocol. It also would have included um, offsets, or well, does include offsets, offsets, uh, dodgy international arrangements. And uh, so it's, it's, it doesn't actually mean a 43% reduction in the amount of actual carbon dioxide being um, emitted into the atmosphere from Australian industry power generation and transport. Now, a passage of the bill was widely interpreted as a win for the Labor Party. Um, however, it also did neutralise a political attack that Labor was mounting against the Greens. The Greens did manage to secure some minor concessions in their negotiations with the Labor Party. However, they were seen to be the ones that compromised the most from their, uh, from their you know, initial starting point. That said, it was quite revealing that the very first question that was asked of Chris Bowen that night on the 7.30 report was about the uh, Labor's approach to uh, the you know, f future fossil fuel developments, um, in particular, the question of a climate trigger. Adam Bant says that this is just round one. The battle moves now to the Senate, where the Greens and David Pocock want to put a climate trigger into environmental regulations to assess the uh, impacts on the climate of new projects. What's wrong with that idea? In other words, the Greens succeeded in raising the question about new fossil fuel developments, which is actually the key question for climate action in this country. Today, we're going to be discussing climate politics, this bill in particular. Were the Greens right to uh, compromise and, part and support the bill? And what does this mean for climate politics going forward? I'm joined by two guests, very pleased to welcome Ben Pennings, who is an environmentalist, also a former Greens candidate, speaking today in a personal capacity, and also, also Sam Wainwright, who is a national co-convener of the Socialist Alliance and a former councillor on the Fremantle City Council. I should point out this uh, discussion was recorded before the actual passage of the bill last Thursday. But listen very closely. I'm sure you'll agree that the comments were made were very prescient, still very 100% relevant today. And uh, I'd love to hear your reaction one way or the other. What you're, If you agree or disagree, please put them in the comments in the, um, the YouTube or wherever you're getting this, um, this uh, episode of the Green Left Show. Love to hear your response. I began by asking Ben to comment on this uh, campaign of um, pressure on the Greens to capitulate the Labor's 43% target and to discuss that. Is this a case of something is better than nothing and at least we've made a start? Or is this a case of just too little, too late in a crisis? Yeah, well, it was yeah unsurprising what Labor came up with because they went to the election with that and it wasn't enough then and it's not enough now. It obviously you know doesn't match the science, but it is something. Um, you know, it was very great to see the Greens not capitulating just to, you know, let it through to pretty much force the issue to, you know, say that it needs to be, you know, a floor, so a minimum rather than the, you know, rather than the, the ceiling. Um, and all the, you know, Labor drips and others were very much, you know, pushing the Greens and the Greens didn't and Labor's come back and said, yes, well, it will be a ceiling. But of course, you know, our, you know, emissions that we use internally are important, but it's also about what we export 
which is the yeah, which is the really big deal and doesn't count to any of our figures. It's very much yes, what we export here and is burnt overseas with regards to thermal coal or met coal or gas, you know, counts to the emissions of other countries. And yeah, that is the the real deal. And unfortunately, Labor have been very, you know, poor and haven't really gone, you know, any further despite the result of the election with regards to you know, anything concrete about minimising or, you know, getting rid of new coal and gas. And Sam, what are your thoughts? Is this a case of something's better than nothing or is this worse than useless? Look, I think with these things, there's nothing wrong with being pragmatic per se. Um, the question is, okay, well, well we know Labor's target is not adequate. It's, 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 not, it's not based on science. It's a political target. Uh is something better than nothing? Well, yes, it can be. I think you have to judge: does it, does does this do more harm than good, or is it a modest but insufficient step forward? That's that's the assessment you really got to make. And I guess that could be made on two levels: one, in just in, in a purely sort of technical sense, um, will it help us reach more ambitious targets than the coalition, for instance? Okay, well, let's let's assume the answer to that is yes. Then the second dimension to the question is how does it play out politically, like in terms of making the argument with the Australian population about uh, the need for more ambitious change? So that's where I think this issue about ceiling or floor is, is important. Um, I think if, uh, if, if it's explicitly described as being a ceiling, then I think you could make an argument for not supporting it at all. If, if it's explicitly described as a floor um, and... and and opens the space for more debate about going further, uh, then you know I think the Greens can make a case for for passing it. You know I think so. I think it'll be a tactical judgment. But I think the important thing too, uh, and this relates to my second point, is that we shouldn't lapse into thinking that whether this legislation is passed or not, and exactly what form is going to, is going to be the decisive determinant uh, as to whether we get decent climate policy in Australia. It's not. Um, What's important is how we relate to the debate around it to create the movement for change that we need. It's very striking that Labor has not made a substantial case for its 43% target. They haven't, for example, released the support of climate scientists advocating for that or released climate modelling or economic modelling or anything else. Their main argument is, this is the number we took to the election. So, Sam, can you just explain, does Labor have a mandate for this target or is, or is there more to it than that? Uh, is it fair for the climate movement to be pushing for a more ambitious target? Well, I, want, I think one thing that's clear is that the Labor Party in practice doesn't recognise climate science. You know, it's not, it's not enough to say that climate change is real. Um, you know, I mean, the coalition, obviously, in, in, a, in an attempt to block real action on climate change, you know, the coalition sort of fell back on two tactics, really. One was, you know either explicitly or implicitly sort of feeding a kind of climate denialism in the first instance. And then their fallback position was just, well, whatever the climate science says, Australia gets a special you know, free pass and a special exception. Um, whatever the world has to do, it doesn't apply to Australia. Australia still gets to sell as many fossil fuels, you know, as it wants to. And the problem, of course, is that Labor essentially has the same position. So Labor, you know, Labor doesn't really want discussion about climate science. I mean, you know, because, you know, the, the, the line in the sand for Labor is any restriction on the ability of Australian fossil fuel capitalism to keep mining more fossil fuels. Um, that's, you know, that, that's untouchable, you know. So that's, that's the sense within, within it for Labor. Climate change is first and foremost a political problem, not a real world problem. You know, the challenge for Labor is, is how to make it appear like they're doing what is what the science calls for without actually doing what the science calls for. And so Labor, Labor I mean, that's not to say, you know, every Labor politicians don't get that <laughs> climate change is real, but, they're real, but their approach is still to treat this like, like it's any other political issue where they can horse trade uh, and, and, and to not accept the fact that, um, you know, climate science is determined by the laws of physics. You, you can't horse trade with the laws of physics. I mean... And, and, and we know that Labor's policies, you know, it's like we're all passengers on a bus careering towards a cliff and Labor is saying, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll apply the brakes to the bus, you know, one metre after it goes over the cliff edge because that's realistic and that's pragmatic. Um, 
you know, say in that sense, you know, like, I mean, that's where it's quite false for Labor to say, oh, but, you know, we we went with, you know, our election target was 43%. They didn't bang on about their target, you know. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think, you know, you know, if 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 they'd gone to the to the Australian people saying, we'll adopt targets that are necessary to stop the risk of runaway global warming, um, then I think Australians still would have voted for it. You know, like it, it's, they've, in truth is, it, I think it's completely disingenuous for them to put up their hands now and say, oh no, goodness me, we couldn't go beyond forty three percent because that would be breaking our election promises. You know, since when did that matter to them? Um, and it's not like they really. You know, it, it, it's you know, it, it's not like they went on a campaign to educate the Australian people about about targets and how they all fit in and what they mean or anything like that. So that debate still has to be had with the Australian people, I would say. And and Ben, what are your thoughts about whether Labor has a mandate or not? Yeah, well, Sam's definitely you know right with regards to the you know what they see as political reality and what's ecological reality. And yes, we need to work within an ecological reality. And yes, of course, they need to think about political reality. And it's you know, no secret there was a record, you know, Greens vote, there's the climate independence. And, you know, people voted for the one, you know, the party's independence that were talking about climate change, whereas Labor wasn't making that any sort of active part of their, uh, of their campaign. So, yeah, it's really about the journey from now on. So yeah, we'll see how that bill goes, you know, in this city of parliament. And, but there's so much more to do, like, unfortunately, you know, some of the environment movement and some other progressive people take a deep breath and relax when a Labor Party gets in and fair enough, because we work hard fighting the Tories. But in a way, we have to work harder because we have a, you know, a party that we know can be pushed to a better position. But unfortunately, they're still accepting fossil fuel donations, they're still wanting to subsidise projects, which in this day and age is, yeah, it's just uh, insane. And, yes, obviously the Greens are going to be very blatant about that and, you know, they're pushing for targets more in line with the ecological reality and there's got to be a political fight. And, unfortunately, because of, you know, state capture and because of the uh, links between both major parties in the fossil fuel industry and the lobbyists and all that stuff that we know about, we really have to push, 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 push to get Labor to a better position. And it really, really, you know, needs to be, you know, led by a grassroots movement and involved like the young people who are, you know, there at the opening of Parliament, First Nations people, you know, all the other community members who are on the, you know, front line who are going to cop it the most. And we need to get their voices out there and support those communities because, and also workers as well, obviously. So, you know, the Labor Party are right saying if we stop the fossil fuel industry in Australia right now, that would be an economic catastrophe, which is correct. But having no fuel and no, no more coal and gas is a no-brainer. We have to do that and we really have to plan for the transition and we have to look after workers. And at the moment, we've got, you know, because of the situation in Ukraine and otherwise, the price of, you know, thermal coal, met coal, gas are extraordinarily high. And we've got these massive corporations, mostly based overseas, profiteering. So you know, the price of you know, electricity and gas doesn't have to be as high as it is. It's because they're profiteering and they're you know, um, raking it in. And yeah, our government should be grabbing some of that back and using that to transition away from these industries and support workers as best as possible. And it's not just the workers in those industries, it's those communities that are around it. Like a lot of you know, workers in the fossil fuel industry get paid pretty well, but it is the, you know, the towns and the service industries that support the industry and people who don't get paid very well. It's, yeah, about you know, their lives and livelihood as well. More, impo more important than the nominal emissions reduction target is the actual process of stopping new coal, gas and fossil fuel developments. Ben, I'm wondering if you could talk about what this uh, new bill means for uh, going forward from here, both in Parliament, but also for the climate movement more broadly. Yeah, well, when we're talking about, you know, a transition to a cleaner economy, it's also about who owns that. So the Greens have been very, you know, open about public ownership, which I think is really important. So, you know, rather than billionaires making money out of fossil fuel and the price of electricity being high, <laughs> it's sort of billionaires making money out of solar you know, we, yeah, publicly owned renewables, you know, is you know, really important and looking after communities while we do that. And I'm really proud 
you know, as a Greens you know, member and previous candidate, uh, etc., is that you know, the Greens have moved more down that you know, uh, you know democratic socialist you know point of view about how important public ownership is, not only with regards to you know uh, you know a transition to a cleaner economy with regards to power, but also with health and education and you know, vaccines and all the stuff that are you know, pushing for dental health care, mental health care, all that sort of stuff. And the more, you know, red for want of a better word that, you know, the Greens have become, the better they've done. And where I am in Queensland is the most radical Greens party in Australia now, and we're doing the best. So it's um, it's been wonderful as like a 20 plus year member to see that transition over time um, and see young people in particular really embrace it because they're the ones who are copying it you know, on the end of the ecological crisis, but also, you know, housing and health, et cetera, as well. They're the ones who are going to, you know, cop it the worst. And Sam, your thoughts about stopping um, fossil fuel developments like Scarborough and Beetaloo and more broadly? Yeah, well, I actually think uh, regardless of what happens in this legislation, the fact that there's been um, debate about precisely about this and that Albanese has clarified that he has no intention of stopping these new fossil fuel projects well on one on one level that's <laughs> that, that's a bad thing it's actually a, it's a good thing that that, that discussion has been flushed out you know because that's the discussion we need to have it's there's been a clarification of positions I mean the International Energy Agency you know is is quite clear we can't have massive new fossil fuel projects like the one like, like, like the ones Australia is proposing such as Scarborough or Beetaloo or new coal or new coal mines, um, and for for Albanese just to sort of you know return to the sort of tired, worn out arguments about oh well if we don't do it, someone else will sort of stuff is just you know it's just intellectually sort of bankrupt stuff you know. Um, so I, I think probably the Greens have scored just even scored a victory on that score, just just, just flushing that discussion out. We, we, we're sort of beginning that discussion. We need to begin that discussion about how how a transition away from fossil fuels could really happen in this country. And how, how, how we do it in a way that takes workers with us, but that, that workers actually run that transition, uh, are, are in charge of it, um, and don't, don't, don't lose their communities or jobs through the process, but actually make better, get, create better jobs and better communities. Now, but of course, to do that, we can't even begin to do that until we actually get, as, as a community, actually even get the revenues from the fossil fuel industry. So, I mean, here in Western Australia, WA has just overtaken Qatar as the world's biggest exporter of LNG. Now, you know, the Australian taxpayer collects a piddling $700 million a year in taxes and royalties from that, which, you know, sounds like a lot of money to you or I, but if you compare it to a place like Qatar, uh, where the industry is state-owned from top to bottom, not that I'm, you know, say, saying that Qatar is a is a social model we want to follow, but nonetheless, in, in Qatar, they collect $17 billion a year. $17 billion. So it just makes you realise that we... Not only is this industry destroying the, you know, threatens to destroy the basis of life on, on, on this planet, but we're giving them, these companies like Shell and Woodside, the resource, and Exxon, the, we're just giving them the resource. And here in WA, they just throw a few pennies in the dirt by way of, you know, sponsorship of cultural and, you know, community and sporting organisations, and we're supposed to feel grateful. Oh, you know, all the, all, all they do, you know. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that it's very clear that we, we need, you know, if, if, we're gonna, if there's going to be a just transition, a just transition is not just going to be a slogan, that we need, then those, the, the resources from the industry as it currently exists need to fund its own obsolescence. That means we as a community need, need to capture that more of, more of that wealth so that can be poured in to, of course, the schools and the hospitals and the environmental repair, but also building the new uh, renewable energy infrastructure. And, and so and so workers in those industries can see here's, here's the plan. There's a pathway. You know, we're going to need your skills as riggers, as crane drivers, as as as, as tugboat operators, as, as underwater welders, all those jobs. We're going to need those skills, your 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 ability to build the offshore wind farms, the tidal and the wave power, the, the solar thermal plants, all that sort of stuff to, to reconfigure our grid. Um but yeah, we you know we have to appreciate that we're really at the beginning of that process. You know, the Labor Party is actually trying to block that process, not 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 not, not help it. That's that's the thing we've got to get our heads around. And I, and I would say too, is that we as activists we need to understand that um, I don't say this to discourage people, but you know we are at the, at the beginning of a long long haul. I mean, I am quite convinced that given 
the strength and power of the fossil fuel industry in this country, that we will need a social movement on a scale we've never seen before in this country to actually for, you know, you think about to actually stop new fossil fuel, fuel projects, you know, ones on the scale of Adani or Scarborough or Beetaloo, you know, we're going to need to see a social movement on a scale we've never seen before. I mean, you know, I can remember the 2003 protests against the Iraq war. I went to the protest in Sydney where there was nearly a million people, but well, maybe it was 500,000, maybe I'm getting carried away. But nonetheless, we're going to need like movements on that scale, but with, with a diversity and intensity that we haven't seen since the anti-Vietnam war campaign. So, you know, it's not going to, you know, one more petition, you know, one more speak out is not going to do it. We need to do those things, but they're building blocks to, to, towards the, um, the social pressure that we're going to need to create. Actually, I recently saw an article talking about the next stage for the uh, the school strike movement is to occupy schools, and that's an encouraging thought that that might happen in this country. But I guess just to finish up, um, Sam, if you would talk about the, the the how the progressive movement can relate more broadly to this government. We're in a situation where the last Scott Morrison government was absolutely dismal. The prospect of a Peter Dutton prime ministership is horrifying to progressive people. And under Albanese, the Labour Party is not exactly offering nothing. We've seen you know, paid domestic leave, um, the dropping of the charges against Bernard Colliery, the Home to Billow campaign um, victory in that case. There's, there's been a number of things that where Labour is offering more than nothing. At the same time, I think it's true to say there are a lot of people making excuses for the limitations and there's a lot of failings of the Labor government as well, um, you know, on a number of things. Uh, so, Sam, can you perhaps give us your thoughts on how the progressive movement would relate to this um, new situation under Albanese? Yeah, look, I don't know that Labor's going to get that much of a honeymoon from people. Um, you know, I think people, I mean, anyone who, who, knows, any, who knows anything about climate science um, understands how, how, how woefully inadequate um, Labor's targets are and, and how hopeless it is just to um, endlessly endorse new um, mega fossil fuel projects. So certainly from from already engaged climate activists, they're not going to get any honeymoon. I, I'm not seeing much excuse making. You know, of course, pe you know, people are pragmatic in the sense, yes, they'll always take up, you know, um, you know, something's better than nothing. But they also understand that, you know, applying the brakes on the bus after you've already gone over the cliff is not enough. You know, people people get that, you know. So I don't, my sense is they're not going to have that much of a honeymoon. We should we should also remember that their their vote actually, their primary vote slightly declined. So it's not like there was a big swell of goodwill and, you know, optimism and all that sort of stuff. I mean, there was a strong vote to get rid of the coalition. Um, and of course, there was the, the election of the Teals and the strong swing to the Greens in Brisbane, um, which Ben has already alluded to. So, that, you know, those are, the, those are the sort of positive positive things to come out of the election. So I don't know that they're going to get that much of a honeymoon. And certainly it's not our job to give them one. <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's for sure. I mean, it's, having said that, it's, it's not that, you know, you know the, the difference between Labor and Coalition isn't purely cosmetic. I mean, Labor has to be able to throw a bone to its base, you know, um, so, I mean, we see that in WA as well. Like, you know, so we've got this bloody Scarborough gas project, which is just enormous, you know. I mean, it, uh, you know, already increases in emissions from LNG production in WA have outstripped, have undone the value of every single solar panel put on every single roof in Australia. You know, I mean, that, that's the enormity of the LNG, of this LNG, you know, because it's, you know, I mean, and that's without even, you know, talking about the, the scope three emissions, you know, when the gas gets burned somewhere else, you know, but it's just this fugitive emissions from, from you know, leakage in the process. And then this CO2 produce is, is, is generated in the actual um, processing of the gas before it can be put on the gas buggies, which are the, you know, the, um, the ships that, you know, take it to South Korea and Japan and China and all the rest of it. So, you know, it, here in WA, for instance, our Labor government, which is absolutely in lockstep with the big um, oil and gas companies, in at their beck and call, but they they are under pressure, you know, and so they that you know they've made a number of concessions on environmental things, which are important things, you know. We don't poo poo them, you know. They're they're important in their own right. So lab, labor's labor's agreed to um, basically phase out logging of, of of native forest, which is important. I mean, activists have fought you know long bitter campaigns in WA to win that. Uh, secondly, they have said that they're going to close the, the two state-owned coal-fired power stations. Um, I mean, they were near the end of their lives anyway, and you know, it wasn't going to be worth trying to refurbish them. Uh, and they're not moving against their privately owned uh, coal and, and gas-fired power stations. But nonetheless, that's still a good thing, right? Um, and, they're, and they're talking about quite an ambitious target to reduce the government's own 
um, emissions. Of course, you know, the government's own emissions, you know, only, only a small percentage of the state's emissions, you know. So it's it's sort of like Labor is is working very hard to find the low-hanging fruit, the symbolic things, or, or even the real things, but that don't call into question the, the fossil fuel industry itself. So that's why, you know, Labor's happy to focus on Australia's domestic stationary electricity production and reducing emissions from them. Um, it, it, Everything and anything to distract attention from the elephant in the room, you know. Um, but I think in practice, the, 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 you know, the grassroots campaign around climate is going to be fought around, you know, these, these kind of single issue campaigns, if you will, but, but embedded in a consciousness of climate. You know, that, that, that's sort of the way politics works, you know, just sort of, try, just sort of trying, to, trying to fight against the climate crisis in its generality is, is sort of hard. You know, where do you protest? You know, how do you measure your success, that sort of stuff? So it is, I think, in practice, it is going to continue to flow out of campaigns to stop this particular fracking project, that particular fracking project, the Scarborough project, a new, you know, new coal mine. I think that's, you know, that's, that's, that, that's, that, that's not a problem um, that we begin at that, that point. Um, you know, the, the people engaged in those, in, in, in those campaigns have a, have a broader consciousness about 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 climate and social transformation. Um, so I think we you know we need to just throw everything we've got at at at, at generating momentum behind behind those. And I think the broader politics will flow from that. Thanks, Sam. And um, yeah, any final comments from you, Ben, about how the progressive movement would relate to the Labor government? Yeah, well, the most uh, you know progressive and environmentally conscious Labor government you know we've had was the Gillard government. You know when the Greens and the climate friendly independents had the balance of power, and yeah, we had some you know quite good outcomes. And even though it was a minority government, more legislation you know went through in that time than all the governments around there. So, and that hasn't happened this time in the lower house. But the Greens and David Pocock do have uh, the balance of power in the Senate, and Labor is going to have a choice about having really, really bad legislation that the LNP and the far right will support or having you know, much better legislation that the Greens and Pocock, you know, will support sometimes with gritted teeth, you know, while the grassroots movement you know, does their thing. And, you know, we've really yet to see which way they'll decide with regards to some, some key issues. So, yeah, the Greens and Pocock will do that work, you know, hopefully very well um, in the Senate, but the grassroots you know, pressure across a broad section of society you know, needs to be there. And there's a lot of people out there you know, experiencing anger, experiencing frustration, experiencing despair, um, you know, of all ages. And, yeah, it's going to come out. And how we harness that and work together in, you know, some ways and the solidarity, you know, we, yeah, we give each other with regards to some of the different tactics that will be used is going to be really important because there will be the attacks from the far right there will be the attacks from murdoch etc so you know and it's been really you know good to see you know, the greens and the climate independents in particular supporting you know some of the more radical action particularly the greens who've you know got that long historical you know cross-pollination with the you know people who are doing you know, direct action and work on the streets you know over many many decades so you know the approach will be yeah, we're going to have to be pragmatic and sophisticated, but we're also going to have to be really staunch and push as hard as we can and be on their tail all the time. Like I'm, yes, can't say too much about what some of my plans are, but hopefully in the next couple of months that will come out. But yeah, any, you know, key Labor decision maker or a Labor member of parliament that over time will be under threat by the Greens or a climate independent are going to have to bloody watch out. You know, they're not going to be able to, you know, go around in their day-to-day -day duties and in the media and the general community without very frustrated community members holding up to account saying, why are you taking this dirty money? Why are you giving our money to new fossil fuel projects when it's going to affect us, our kids, our grandkids, and any sort of, you know, our not only livable planet, but a healthy economy uh, as well. So, yeah, it's going to be a fascinating time. It is going to be frustrated. We're going to be bashing our heads against there as well, and we know what Labor are like. And a leopard doesn't change their spots overnight. But, yeah, we're going to have to push them and be staunch and support each other. Before we finish up, and since we've been talking about climate targets, I did want to just address this question of the, the coal mine that Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek rejected last Thursday, the same day as the, um, as the climate bill was passed. 
And, I, you know, this is interesting to look at because on the one hand, this uh, could be an indication of the, the pressure that Labor is under to appear to look good to actually reject um, new fossil fuel developments. And this is the first time um, that, a, that a, you know, that a coal mine of this kind has been rejected. Although there is more to the story as well. Um, that uh, means that we shouldn't necessarily get overexcited about what this means. And I just wanted to amplify the, the words of Emerald Moon, who's the co-host of uh, the Serious Danger podcast, about what the meaning of this um, rejection is. But I also think that not too much should be taken from this, given that Labor governments have typically not been that afraid to be shown to stand up to Clive Palmer because Clive Palmer is not a popular person mm. uh, and he's also so, like pretty much he's associated with the LNP. The ALP loses nothing mm. from standing up to Clive Palmer. He's not their friend. And similarly, like when I heard this, I got confused because Palmer has multiple proposals in Queensland. He has right. this one, which is actually a smaller coal mine um, in the little sticks basin on the coast, a central Queensland coast basically. But the big one that people might be thinking of is the Galilee Basin coal project. Galilee Basin being the same place where Adani is doing their coal mine. It had never been mm. mined before and it, that's why it was so fucking devastating when Labor in Queensland gave them their final approvals for Adani to go ahead because it opens up the Galilee Basin. And now Clive Palmer wants to get in there too. It's more inland. But he also recently tried or he's trying to build a new coal-fired power station in 2022 to power that coal mine, right, in that same area. And he tried to not even go through any state or federal approvals to do it under this, like, loophole in the planning law. He tried to just get council approval from, from the fucking <laughs> local council. He's like, I'm just going to go through the council. And everyone was like, this is fucking insane. Massive pressure from environmental groups. Eventually, Queensland state government goes, we're going to use our call-in powers under the Planning Act to call this in, which is where they they are like, nah, oh, we're taking it from council and we're looking at it because it's so significant. They still yeah. haven't, like, they haven't stopped it necessarily, but they called it in. But my point being that, yeah, Labor standing up to Clive Palmer, I wouldn't take that as a as a as as an indication that they're going to be stopping new coal and gas mines um, yeah. due to climate impacts. Yeah, stand up to Woodside, who gave them $100,000 exactly. in the 2018 2019 financial year and is behind the $16 billion Scarborough project. Please, let's see yeah. how that, that rolls out. All right, well, that brings our Green F show to an end. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Big thanks to um, Ben and Sam uh, for your time today. Thank, th thanks, Alex, and good to meet you, Ben. You too. Thanks, Alex. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, it makes a big difference. As I said at the beginning, if you do like the work that we um, that we do, please become a Green Left supporter, which is essential to for our continuing our work. If you don't want to become a supporter, you can also check us out on Patreon as a way to support Green Left. And without even spending a cent, you can give this video or podcast a thumbs up. Please share it, help us build the audience. And until next time, we'll see you soon.